Welcome back to the second episode of The End Times. Now, the reason we're doing this series is because, number one, it, there are so many blessings, according to Revelation 1, that you receive when you take the time to understand prophecy, specifically Revelation. But the other reason is, is I personally believe that we are truly living in that time that Jesus refers to as the end of the age. Now, there's a lot of reasons why I believe that. I want to start off by saying, if you haven't seen last week's episode, um, definitely go back and see episode one, because Jesus Christ himself points to uh, how you can know if, you are, if that end of age is coming. Um, and it's, it's very clear. The interesting thing that Jesus does there is he also tells uh, the disciples shortly after saying, here's how you can know, he also then says that uh, he comes like a thief in the night. No one will know the, the night or the hour. Now, I want to start off by saying God is clearly, Jesus Christ himself has clearly made it obvious when that season will be. Just because you know the season does not mean that you know the exact day. And Jesus Christ pointed towards May 15th, 1948, as the blooming of the fig tree, when, when Israel becomes a nation again, you will know that, that those things are coming and that that generation will not pass away until all things are complete. Now, generation, life-wise, life if you were born on May 15th, 1948, and you happen to live 120 years, that means there's roughly about 45,000 nights available in that season for Jesus to come back. And if somebody told me that I need to look for a thief, and they don't know when he's coming, but it's somewhere within these 45,000 nights. Um, I think that's enough to know that you do not know when the thief is coming, but you do know the season, and we are definitely in that season. So episode two is going to really point towards what Jesus was saying of the blooming of the fig tree. Um, how do we know? So we're going to go into Ezekiel. Now, we're going to look at Ezekiel 4, 1 through 7. If you have your Bibles, that's where we're going to be at. And Ezekiel lived um, in Babylonian captivity. So when Jeremiah had predicted uh, through prophetic um, things that there would be the 70 years of captivity, Babyl Babylon came and conquered Israel and took the Jews into captivity. And Ezekiel lived through that. And he was then released. And Ezekiel was written shortly after the freedom of the Jews. Now, I want to start off, before we get into Ezekiel's prophecy, on May 15th, 1948, being the day of the blooming of the fig tree. Uh, before we get into that, I do want to say that um, this right here, what we're about to look at, typically kind of blows people's minds. Um, because after you read it and after you understand it, it's hard to, to believe that anybody wouldn't believe in God. I mean, how can you point to the exact day? There was a time when I was working in New York City that I was out to lunch with a bunch of co-workers and typically what I found in New York City is there's a lot of atheists living there and at this particular lunch um, thing that I was at, I was the only Christian there of about 20 people and they started talking about God and they looked at me knowing that I was the only believer at that table and they said, how do you know that God is real? And I thought for a second, because I love those people and I wanted to give them a good solid answer. And what I came up with was, how can you deny a God that time after time in his word makes predictions of kingdoms rise and falls? And sometimes he names kings specifically and he gives exact dates and who will be victorious in certain wars and what those dates will be. And time and time again, it has been proven to be exactly accurate every single time. How can you deny a God like that? And Ezekiel is just one example of that. Now, I want to also, before we get into this, is share that Ezekiel's message, if you look, if you read Ezekiel, generally what you could get is his message is really an equal balance of God's judgment and his comfort and blessing. And he's often preaching of this endless love that God continually gives, regardless of uh, the need for judgment. So, um, I also want to mention that why is the prophecy of Israel so important? And that's really because in the very beginning, 
of Genesis, uh, there was a covenant that God made with Abraham that, that he would give birth to a, a chosen people. And it wasn't that those people were necessarily special or they had superpowers or anything like that. It was just that those people would be the bloodline of Jesus Christ. So obviously God is going to lay down laws for the people that are going to be the lineage of his only begotten son more than the Gentiles. And that's why the Jews are so important. And that's why Jewish prophecy is extremely important because Jesus Christ himself was a Jew. And that's why they were considered the chosen people um, because from the very beginning, God made a way. So in Matthew 24, like we spoke about last time, there's this blooming of the fig tree and that points towards um, the blooming of the fig tree when Israel becomes a nation again after thousands of years of being not a nation or being run by somebody else. So we're just going to first mention that Ezekiel was written in about 550 BC and it points to the exact day of Israel becoming a nation again, May 15th, 1948. So what I'm going to recommend is get a piece of paper and a pen or pencil to write on because I'm going to throw some numbers at you. I'm going to give you my interpretation of the math. But a lot of this you may need to go back and look at it again yourself. And I highly encourage you to do because, again, if somebody ever asks you, how do you know that God is real? Man, this is a great example of how you can know that he is real. So we're just going to jump right in. Again, we're in Ezekiel 4. And we're going to start off with verse 1, and we're going to go through verse 7. You also, son of man, take a clay tablet and lay it before you and portray on it a city, Jerusalem. Lay siege against it. Build a siege wall against it and heap up a mound against it. Set camps against it also and place battering rams against it or all around. Moreover, take for yourself an iron plate and set it as an iron wall between you and the city. Set your face against it, and it shall be besieged, and you shall lay siege against it. This will be a sign to the house of Israel. Lie also on your left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of the days that you lie on it. You shall bear their iniquity. For I have laid on you the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, 390 days. So you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when you have completed them, lie again on your right side, then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah, forty days. I have laid on you a day for each year. Therefore you shall set your face towards the siege of Jerusalem. Your arm shall be uncovered, and you shall prophesy against it. Now, the first time somebody had read that to me, the pastor that read that to me, his response after, afterwards was, clear as mud, isn't it? Reading this, um, at first glance, I have no idea what it is that Ezekiel is hearing from God and what this even means. But if you take the time to look at it closely, it is an amazing prophecy that was given around 550 BC. So we're just going to take all the numbers that God gave and we're going to kind of turn that into a math and I'm going to explain it as we go. So bear with me. Again, I highly recommend this, that you write this down. So what God did in 4, 1 through 3, or 1 through 4, is what he said is, you know, the, Judah and Israel have sinned against God. And this has been the way it was since they first left um, Egypt. And he's saying, you know what, you owe me. More so, God had told the Israelites to rest the land on the seventh year. Now, if, you, if God tells you to rest the land on the seventh year, or he tells you to rest on the seventh day, um, He's going to get his days, and here he's going to get his years. If the, if the Jews aren't going to rest the land, he is going to rest the land. So according to the house of Israel, what they owe God is 390 days. Now, he says here earlier that a day is a year. Um, now, that's, not that's written otherwhere in the Bible, but right here in Ezekiel, um, it, it says that in three, for I've laid on you the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days. So for every day that, that Ezekiel is meant to lay on his side, uh, that's the number of years uh, that the Jews owe God. So essentially he set a besiege, he's creating this clay siege against Israel, and, and then he's just told to lay on his side for 390 days for the iniquity of, of Israel. Then once that's over, lay on your other side for 40 days. So what he's saying ultimately is that the Jews owe God 390 plus 40 days or 40 years. 
Um, so that's 430. 390 plus 440 is 430. So there, God's saying, you owe me 430 years, Israel. All right. So now that we've established, it's pretty easy math. Just 390 plus 40 equals 430. Now, what I want to say about this next is that if you look at Leviticus twice, in Leviticus 26.18, as well as Leviticus 26.27 through 28, twice God warns the Jews that if this continues, and obviously it did because this is many years later, that he is going to punish them seven times what they owe him. So according to this, they owe him 360, or, or I'm sorry, um, 430 years. Now, the Jews just got out of captivity for 70 years. So again, so we're, we're looking at 430 years is what they owe God. If you take away 70 years for time served, call it, because they just got out of 70 years captivity when God gave this prophecy. Really what they owe God is 360 years. So God's saying you owe me 360 years. According to Leviticus, you take that times 7. 360 times 7 equals 2,520 years. So God is going to punish Israel for 2,520 years. Now, something you got to understand is that um, the Jews, their year was a little bit different than our year. Their year was referred to as a lunar year. Our year is a 365-day-a-year year. The Jews' year is a 360-day year. A year. So if you take, we're just going to convert the years into days now. So God's saying, I'm punishing you for 2,520 years. Converting that into lunar years, that equals 907,200 days. So what God is saying is he's going to punish the Jews for 907,200 days. Now, if you then take that number, <laughs> and you take the exact date and it's it's a very recorded date in history um, when the Jews were released from captivity um, ultimately their captivity they're taken captive by the Babylonians but shortly before their release the Persians conquered the Babylonians and then it was King Cyrus released the Jews and set them free on July 23rd 537 BC now, if you go forward 907,200 days from July 23rd, 537 B.C., it equals exactly the date, May 15th, 1948. Um, and that, that's just math. I can't manipulate that. I can't change that. The calendar and history have all been already claimed. Um, this is just simply an exact prediction. God told Ezekiel how long he was going to punish the Jews, and he did it to the exact date. So I'm just going to go through that one more time because I, I really want you to be able to go back and check your math um, because I don't want you to take my word for it. Um, so again, God told Ezekiel he's going to punish the Jews for, 300, or for the Israelites 390 years, and then add Judah's iniquity, 40 years, that gives you 430 years. Minus 70 for their captivity, that gives you 360 years. Times 7, according to Leviticus 28, that gives you 2,520 years. Take that and convert it to lunar years, 360, and, and convert that to days. There's 360 days per year, so essentially I'm taking 2,520, and I'm timesing it by 360. That gives you 907,200 days. Now, the way that you get from there, unless you get a break out of calendar, you count every day, which don't do. Uh, the way you get there from there is then uh, July 23rd, 537 BC was when the Jews were set free by King Cyrus. And then, of course, May 15th, 1948 is when they became a nation again. Uh, there's 907,200 days between uh, King Cyrus and release and uh, when the UN and the US recognized the Jewish nation as an independent state in May 15th, 1948. You just simply take the 907,200 days and then you convert that back into years, our, our years, which, would be, which is the calendar we're using for May 15th, 1948. And then you just take that um, 
divided by 365, and that'll give you the exact number of years, and again, you can go back and do the math. Um, so, man, I tell you, I, I really don't understand how when somebody can see this and understand it, that they couldn't believe in God, but uh, it's very important to also understand that uh, Jesus himself said that those, just because you have ears doesn't mean you can understand it. Like, you, you have to believe to fully understand it. But if you believe, this is going to make a lot of sense to you. So, again, that was Ezekiel 4. Um, I recommend that you, you take the time to really write that down, because if you didn't write it down, go back and watch it again. Especially if you're a believer, because if, if you're ever sitting at lunch with somebody and they say to you, how do you know, uh, man, <laughs> it's math. It's a law. Like I, you can't change math. Two plus two is always four, and nine are in seven thousand two hundred days. They they just lead to the day, uh, May fifteenth, nineteen forty eight. And there's nothing anybody can do to change that. Both those dates are recorded in history, and there's only and there's exactly nine hundred seven thousand two hundred days between those two events. So uh, again, man, thank you for taking the time. Uh, this was mostly to to show that this blooming of the fig tree has occurred. Um, and just like to the exact date that God said it would occur to Ezekiel. And I really want to um, kind of emphasize, do go back and, and even like I have it written down um, actually physically in my Bible um, in that verse. So no matter where I'm at, when I'm at, I always have my Bible on me so I could break this verse out. Um, I believe next time we are going to get into uh, the rapture of the church next. Um, because I want to point towards that. That's a big question mark on a lot of people's minds, and I want to talk about, well, before we get into what's about to happen, uh, let's talk about what uh, is going to happen in the church. Uh, it's a very important point, and so we're going to happen in Second Chronicles and a few other places. So next time we're going to talk about the rapture of the church. We may spend a couple on that. Um, and then, of course, we're going to get into Revelation verse by verse, and it's going to be awesome. So you guys, thanks for enjoying this this ride down this path with me. It's, it's a lot of fun to study, and I really believe as you continue to study this, you're going to see blessings come about that, that you didn't have before you took the time to understand this. Uh, if you don't believe me, go back and read Revelation 1, 4, where it promises you, if you take the time to understand this, there's certain blessings just for you. So you guys, thank you. God bless you. Um, if you have any questions on this, never hesitate to reach out. I'd love to see your comments below because um, this little path that we're walking down is definitely going to be a community of it's doing it together. If you like this video, click like and subscribe. If you feel called to support our channel to Patreon, that link is below. But the most important part of this channel is we take prayer requests, so never hesitate to send that in. Thank you for watching this episode of God Family Guns, and as always, love God, love your family, love guns.